Okay, I got myself some new equipment, which is exciting for me. Maybe for you too, depending on how the quality of these next recordings turns out. But I am excited, so that should get you pretty excited. All right, where were we? We need to be talking about the periodic table, which is what we're looking at right here. There's a lot to be said here. There's a lot going on, and, and so you'll have to review this and, and, uh, and then some. But basically, you already know that each of these symbols here, these letters, or a combination of two letters, represents uh, an element, okay? And they're arranged by atomic number, right? So here, atomic number, 4 for beryllium, for example, that number corresponds directly to the number of protons in the nucleus. We, dis we covered earlier in the lecture that the nucleus has neutrons and protons and protons are the positively charged particles and it's also the proton that gives an element its character so an element that has four protons has atomic number four and it will always be beryllium no matter what the number of neutrons is okay uh, so that's atomic number and uh, uh, we also have rows and periods we're gonna call the rows like this here it would be the third for some reason it wanted to switch on me here right so this would be the third row we call those periods okay rows are called periods and columns are called groups and these groups have names okay every element in in a particular group has a similar character similar electronic makeup similar reactivity and that's why they're put together in in a group this first group here is called alkali metals okay except hydrogen isn't a metal hydrogen is a nonmetal so and you see this little bold line here that kinda indicates that hydrogen doesn't really belong in there it does electronically but it is a nonmetal and it's really kind of an oddball um, in the periodic table it's also very unique because it just has one proton and that's it one proton and one electron Okay, so the alkali metals, lithium, sodium, potassium, that's group one. Group two are the alkaline earth metals. All right. Then we skip through this, this block here, and we go to group three, which I don't know what the name is. Then group four here are the carbonoids. Group five, starting with nitrogens, are the nictogens, chalcogens, halogens and Nobel gases. Nobel gases are, have a full electronic configuration okay and this is why uh, we have a cutoff here and we start a new period after we get to each of these Nobel gases. So in a way when you get to 2, 10, 18, 36 and so forth you end up at, at some sort of stability and, and there are chapters devoted to that for now, we're just we're just glancing at the periodic table, uh, looking at regions, right? So, so what I just named all of these these rows or groups, not rows, they're they're columns and they're called groups: alkaline earth, alkaline metals, halogens, noble gases, nitrogens, etc. Right? Those are those are all also sometimes referred to as as group A, okay? And then what's in the center here is, is group B. Uh, however, some people just say group 1 through 18, so they just continue here, like so group 1, group 2, and then that would be 3, so instead of group 3 here, this would just be then group 13, so you'll see that, and then that makes that group 18 or 8A, right, 8, Roman numeral 8, and then A indicating that it's in, in the A in the main group, okay. Then we also have metals and nonmetals on here. I already mentioned that these are the alkali metals, but hydrogen is a nonmetal, right? So you have this little divide, thicker line here, this dividing line that divides the metals and the nonmetals, okay? And so you've got the metals to the left, and you have the nonmetals to the right. And then some of those metals on the border here, like germanium and arsenic, antimony, tin they are referred to as the metalloids. Okay, they have a character in between a metal and a non-metal. 
And that's important to remember the metals and the nonmetals and where they are bonding between atoms is directly related to their character, to their metallic character. Okay. There's more to it, but we'll get to that in a different chapter. As I mentioned, hydrogen really is not a metal. It does belong here, right there where it is, because it has of its atomic number and it, because of its electronic configuration. But it really, as a character, fits in more between boron and hydrogen. Not electronically, just as a character. All right? So that is just the tip of the iceberg. This is just a summary of the different of the different uh, groups since I just rattled them off. So here you have them written down. I, I, I won't. And here you see the distinction of instead of group one, we have group one A or group two A. And and so then I didn't have a name for the boron group, but then boron group would be would be group three. A. So then I don't have to, I can refer to it as as such, and that you can remember, okay? All right. So there are other ways to look at the periodic table, right? And 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 this is maybe more important for you to remember that we have these blocks. So they're they're not somewhat color coded here. We have this this green area here. If I refer to it as a block, that would be the D block here, right? The D block is called the transition metals. And uh, the main group, or the group, uh, the group A, everything in group A, which is this block here, refer to the S block. And uh, this block, which is the P block. So the S block and the P block are the main group elements, okay? And so you can refer to the the S block are all main group metals, but there are also some. Of course, there are some elements on in the P block that are main group metals. You can say main group metals or main group elements, main group nonmetals, and then the D block are all metals. They're called transition metals. And then if you look at what's down here, this is called the F block, sometimes called the inner transition metals. And they are divided into lanthanides and actinides, rare earth elements. They are not very abundant, and our chemistry, UCHEM 1 and UCHEM 2, are going to look at, at main group and transition metals, and, and we really don't look at those lanthanides and actinides. Yet we have to be aware of them. They, they are important. There are elements like europium and gadolinium that are used in electronic devices for color. And also, gadolinium is actually used as a contrasting agent in MRI and other devices like that. But that's beside the point. And, and uh, they, they are, you might wonder why these are down here and they're excluded. They really belong inside of here. Okay, if you look, there's, there's, oops, I'm off by a little bit. They belong here, right? See, so you see there's 57 and then we have that gap. So this is where cerium through lutentium is inserted. The lanthanides, lanthanum starts off the lanthanide series here, right? So it should really be cut, and that should be inserted. And so these are referred to the the uh, the inner transition elements sometimes. And and so the same thing then for the actinides between actinum and rather thorium, 89 and 104. You've got the actinide series here, 19 thorium through lawrencium inserted, and. Uh, but we take it out so that we can focus on on what's important here, right? And so some of the the groups are are labeled here, alkaline earth, but we know that already halogens and noble gases. But I want to focus on on the blocks here in this particular case. Uh, again, just a summary summary of vocabulary, okay? And let's take another look at the periodic table. There's something that was left out, and that is the atomic the average atomic mass number, right? The other periodic table just had the atomic number above the symbol, but it was missing the average atomic mass, right? And so if we take any of these here, like say calcium, and uh, you know that the nucleus has 20 protons, right? So calcium has 20 protons. And the other mass, the other component of the, uh, 
in the nucleus is a, a number of neutrons, okay? And so since neutrons and protons have roughly the same atomic mass, and the total mass number, which is the average atomic mass, is 40.08, uh, it is very likely that a lot of these elements, a lot of the calcium atoms, have also 20 protons, which would add up to 40. Okay, but the average atomic mass doesn't quite add up to 40. It's 40.08. Okay, and that is because in nature, 97% of all of the calcium atoms have this 20 to 20 ratio. Okay, I'm sorry. This is of course a neutron, right? 20 neutrons and 20 protons. It turns out that 3% of the calcium atoms out there in nature ha either have 21, 22, or 23 neutrons. Okay, but they are not very abundant. So if you if you know exactly how much you can actually calculate this average atomic mass. And not all of them are are abundant in a single isotope as as close as calcium. If you look at chlorine, for example, right? Chlorine has a an average atomic mass of 35.45. So there's there's a number of of uh, of isotopes here that have different numbers. So just be aware that that's just an average, and that in nature we have so-called isotopes, and isotopes are atoms that have nuclei with the same atomic number but different different number of neutrons, right? And so sometimes, uh, most of the time you'll hear me in the book refer to this as isotope or isotopes, but uh, if you're looking at a single one and a single atom, then it's referred to a nuclide, nuclide, and so nuclear chemistry and, and, uh, and the atom bomb and all this is based on some of this, this stuff. Okay, so if we are dealing with isotopes, and we're referring to isotopes, they, we, in, we write its symbol a little bit differently, right? So here we have gold, and gold has atomic number 79. That means we have 79 protons. And if you look at the average, that's almost 197, right? So if you, you have 197 total number, and 79 of them are protons, that means 118 of them have to be neutrons. So most isotopes of gold are probably going to have 118 neutrons and a total. Let's just guessing, okay? So if we if we write that as a symbol, that particular isotope, we would put the atomic number on the bottom, right? The symbol is the same, and so the atomic number 79 comes down here. And it's almost redundant because if that number was anything other than 79, this symbol wouldn't be AU anymore. Okay, so those two correspond to each other. Any element, any atom that has 79 protons, no matter how many neutrons there are, will have, will have, will be gold. Will okay, and, and so the total mass number then would be 197. That's just for one isotope that has 118 neutrons. If another isotope had 120 neutrons, then the symbol would actually be 199 AU and then the 79. So this number plus 79 is going to add up to the total atomic number. And if, if this was an isotope that I was referring to, sometimes I would call this gold 199. Gold 199 refers to its total atomic mass, and then that all you need to know, know is go to the periodic table and look up the symbol AU, right? Uh, if I tell you gold 199, you look that up, you know AU is 79, and then you simply, if I tell you, uh, you have to subtract 79 from 199 to arrive at the fact that we have 120 neutrons. Okay, so let's take another look and actually calculate the the average. Let's let's see. Let's calculate the average atomic mass 
of boron based on the information that I give you. Okay, so this is just an F estimate. So roughly 20% of, of boron in nature has five neutrons. Okay, so it's boron 11, right, which is, which is shown here. And 80% of it m is boron 11, which is six neutrons. Okay, and so if I know that, I can, I can argue that, well, 80 of these atoms have a mass of 11 and then 20 out of 100 have a mass of 10 and so if I add all that up I get 10 80 so 100 of them are going to have an atomic mass unit altogether of 10 1080, right? And so if I wanted to average that out, I divide it by 100, and I get an average atomic mass of 10.80, which is not quite there, but I'm not giving you all of the... I'm not working with three significant figures here. I'm working just with two. So this is just to show you where that number comes from, okay? So those are isotopes. Let's practice these isotopes. And... and uh, drawing them. This is just a solution, right? So here are some examples. You should be able to determine the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons based on a symbol, okay? So this is this is just regular hydrogen here. One and one is just one proton. And this actually is so common that it gets its own name. It's called deuterium. and it has one neutron. Uh, it is stable, it's a stable isotope, whereas tritium here has, a, uh, has two neutrons. It's not stable. Okay? It is actually radioactive. Right? So we have stable and unstable isotopes. And, but those are all uh, naturally abundant. Hydrogen is by far 99 point something percent abundant. Don't remember the ex exact number. If you're interested, you can Google that. And we have the same for carbon. Carbon 12 is 99 percent abundant here, right? So this just means we have 12 minus 6. We have 6 neutrons, 7 neutrons, and 8 neutrons. And this is the one that's radioactive. It undergoes something called beta decay. And you may have heard of carbon dating, and this is the element, carbon-14, that is used for carbon dating. I'm not going to talk about nuclear chemistry. Just throw that out at you, okay? And again, you should be able to figure out, how about electrons? How do you know how many electrons something has? Well, it is the positive charges in the center that tell you how many negative charges we need. So if hydrogen has one proton, sorry, that, I want to circle that one, that's the atomic number, then we need one electron, right? And so that's true for all of these isotopes. The, other th the only thing that matters are here, so that's different, are the number of neutrons. And the number of electrons is always the same. So carbon always has six electrons, okay? Neutral elements always have the same number of electrons as protons. Now, when they become charged particles, then they lose or gain electrons. But we'll talk about that in Chapter 5. Let's take a look at a couple more, okay? So, if I give you, for example, and I might refer to this as plutonium um, Plutonium-238 has this symbol here, right? So uh, that means that we have, if you wanted to calculate the number of neutrons, you have to take 238 minus 94. And that gives you uh, 144 neutrons. And of course, it has 94 electrons and 94 protons. Bromine 79, if you take 79 and you subtract that 35, which is the number of protons, 79 is a total number, you end up with 34 neutrons, 
35 protons and 35 neutrons sorry electrons okay all right so what if I ask you what is the symbol of an atom with 38 protons and 40 neutrons okay what you want to do is you want to go to the periodic table and find atomic number 38 okay you find 38 you've, you've do, just discovered the identity of this particular isotope so it's going to be strontium and that 38 goes on the bottom okay and I said 40 neutrons okay so then you add up the number of neutrons and protons to come up with the isotope number and 40 plus 38 is of course 78 so this would be strontium 78 okay so this should not be that complicated I suggest that you do some practicing practice these isotopes familiarize yourself and then go ahead and watch the next lecture <laughs>